On today's episode of Based on a True Story, we're going to compare history with the movie Mary, Queen of Scots. Oh, and I'm not talking about the 1971 British movie. I'm also not talking about the 2013 Swiss movie. I'm talking about the 2018 movie that shares the same name with multiple movies before it. Our film today was nominated for two Oscars, Best Achievement in Makeup and Hairstyling and Best Achievement in Costume Design. It didn't win either, losing to Vice for Makeup and Hairstyling and Black Panther for Costume Design, respectively. At the helm was first-time director Josie Rourke, And the movie was written by House of Cards writer Bo Williman, who adapted the screenplay from a book by John Guy called Queen of Scots, The True Life of Mary Stewart. So sit back, relax, and let's travel back in time to the Elizabethan era as we learn about the woman who history remembers as Mary, Queen of Scots. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before starting our story today, there's two things we need to do. Now, if you're a long-time listener, you already know what they are. But if you're new to the show, welcome. The first thing we need to do is to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. Here's how it works. I'm about to give you three facts. Two of them are true, which means one of them is an all-out lie. Your task throughout this episode is to find which one is the lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Mary's first husband was the king of France. Number two, Mary married her cousin. Number three, Mary was executed for her part in killing her husband. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, keep your ears peeled because somewhere throughout the episode, I'll mention the two facts. Those are the true facts. And then, by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Now, the last thing to do before getting to our story today is to get a quick recap of what we've covered on the producer's feed recently. With my change in schedule, as you can tell, I've had less time to put together the full-length episodes, but the minisodes on the producer's feed don't take quite as long, so there have been actually a couple of them that have come out. The first was just before the July 4th holiday, and I thought it'd be a lot of fun to chat about the 90s classic movie, Independence Day. Then there was another one where we looked at Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It was a lot of fun to chat about those movies and try to compare some of the things that we saw in those very fictional movies with things that actually happened, or at least that people have claimed to have actually happened. If you want to get access to the producer's feed where you can access all of the back catalog of minisodes and bonus content, as well as any new ones as they are released, all you have to do is to sign up to support the show for, well, whatever you want. It's a pay what you want model to get access to hours and hours of past bonus content and all the future minisodes and bonus episodes as they are released. Just my way of saying Thank you for helping me pay the bills around here and keep the podcast going for yet another episode. You can get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. All right, now let's begin our dive into the true story behind the movie, Mary, Queen of Scots. The movie opens with a paragraph of white text on a black background to set up the situation for us. By reading the text, we learn that Mary, Queen of Scots, was born a Catholic. However, as Protestants are fighting to control Scotland, she was sent to Catholic France as an infant. Then, at age 15, she married the heir to the French throne. Three years later, she returns to a now Protestant-dominated Scotland as a widow, Her half-brother is on the throne in Scotland. Meanwhile, England is run by the Protestant Queen Elizabeth, but Mary also has a strong claim to England's throne, threatening Elizabeth's power. That is all true, but there is a lot more to the story. 
For example, and this is something that we see a lot of in movies that depict this era of history, the movie never really explains why the Protestants and Catholics hated each other so much. All we see is that there's Catholic France and Protestant England, and so we just assume that they're enemies, but why does that matter? As with all things religious, the differences between Catholicism and Protestantism can be an entire podcast series by itself, and it probably is, but that is not this podcast. And yet, the purposes of our story today make it very important to try to understand that question. Why does it matter? After all, Catholics and Protestants both consider themselves to be Christians— So if you're looking at these two different denominations of Christianity from outside the religion, it can be difficult to understand why there was so much hatred for each other that they'd use God's name to justify breaking one of God's laws, thou shalt not kill. While the disagreements between Catholics and Protestants today, fortunately, are not on the same level as it was centuries ago, During the timeline of the movie, no one can deny the long history of disagreements, fights, and even deaths between these two religions. And in the end, if we were to try and simplify the why behind the animosity between these two religions, it would be exactly that, a long history of disagreement between two religions. As the centuries passed, the disagreements got bigger and more brutal. For example, there were Catholics who accused Protestants of manipulating the role of saints, priests, and the canon of Scripture itself. Then Protestants would accuse Catholics of preaching a gospel based on works or worshiping the Virgin Mary. That'd be Mary, the mother of Jesus, not Mary, Queen of Scots. These are just a couple small examples, but boiling it down, those issues stem from how Protestants and Catholics determine the authority of God. Catholicism follows the scriptures, but ultimately how those scriptures are interpreted comes from the official teachings of the Vatican. On the other hand, Protestants believe one must have their own private interpretation of the scriptures to determine their meaning. In other words, they don't believe in the authority of the Vatican. Something else in those opening paragraphs that is true but overly simplified is how it talks about how Mary is going to France. And when we dig into that a little deeper, we can get a sense for just how complex Mary's life was bound to be from the very beginning. The movie doesn't show this, but Mary Stewart was born on December 8, 1542, during a period of history when a lot of people believed that the rift between Protestants and Catholics was at its greatest. That day, December 8th, was important to Catholics because it was believed to have been the day that the Virgin Mary was conceived. And that's one reason why Mary Stuart was given the name Mary, because she was born on the day celebrated as the day of the Virgin Mary's conception by the Roman Catholic Church. But that's not the only reason. Like many children, Mary was also named after her mother. On December 14th, just six days later, Mary's father was killed. He was King James V of Scotland, and he died on the battlefield after the Scottish were defeated at the Battle of Solway Moss. Although it's worth pointing out that he didn't die in the battle, he died soon after the battle from complications that some people think might have been from contaminated water. So, technically, that made the baby Mary the Queen of Scotland at only six days old. Practically, though, a six-day-old child cannot rule a kingdom. That meant two things. First, Mary was sent off to be raised by others until she was ready to take her place on the throne. Second, it meant the throne of Scotland was simultaneously controlled by regents while also being ripe for other countries to try to take control. In particular, both France and England wanted to take control of that throne in Scotland. The French were much closer to gaining that control because, well, Mary Stuart's mother was French. She was Mary of Guy and was the second wife of King James V. So that's why, just like in the movie, that opening paragraph of text, after her father's death, Mary was sent as an infant to France. But that didn't stop England from trying to gain control. King Henry VIII of England proposed a treaty that would give England power over Scotland once Mary took over. 
The Treaty of Greenwich was signed on July 1st, 1543, when Mary was just six months old. The treaty basically said that when Mary turned 10, she would move to England and marry King Henry VIII's son, Edward. That would obviously give Mary a very England-friendly upbringing during her formative years. But that never ended up happening. One of these Scottish cardinals in power at the time was named David Beaton. It was Cardinal Beaton who was trying to push a French alliance with Scotland. This was in no small part because France was a Catholic nation, while King Henry VIII separated the Church of England from the Catholic Church in 1543. If you want to learn more about that story from a different perspective, check out the episode of Based on a True Story covering the movie The Other Bolin Girl. So, King Henry VIII was not a fan of Cardinal Beaton's plan to boost Scottish and French relations. Included in those plans was Mary's coronation, which took place on September 9, 1543, at the castle in Stirling, Scotland. Henry tried to stop Beaton's plan, and as part of that, some of Henry's men arrested some Scottish merchants bound for France. That arrest, and I'm sure plenty of persuasion from Cardinal Beaton, was enough for the Scottish regent at the time, James Hamilton, the second Earl of Arran, to side with Beaton and convert to Catholicism. Soon after, in December of 1543, the Scottish Parliament rejected the Treaty of Greenwich. Mary's fate was changed yet again, and she wasn't even one year old yet. This gives you an idea of just how chaotic Mary's life would end up being. A few years later, and with the treaty between Scotland and England out of the picture, King Henry II of France took advantage of the opportunity and made a proposal of his own. That's how Mary, now five years old, was sent back to France as she was promised to the heir to the throne in France, a three-year-old boy named Francis. On April 4th, 1558, Mary signed an agreement that, as Queen of Scots, Scotland would become a part of France if she died without any heirs. That agreement also included a clause that would hand over her claim to the throne of England to the French under the same conditions, that Mary herself didn't have a legitimate heir to hand it off to. Then, a few weeks later, on April 24th, Mary was married to Francis. The following year, in 1559, King Henry II of France died unexpectedly. That made Mary's husband, King Francis II of France. Just like the movie says, though, that marriage did not last long. Francis was not in good health and died on December 5, 1560. Meanwhile, over in England, something else happened that only added to the complications of an already complex landscape of royalty in Europe. Just a few months after Mary signed the agreement to bequeath Scotland and her claim to the English crown to France if she didn't have any heirs, that came into play. You see, King Henry VIII's eldest daughter, Queen Mary I of England, died in November of 1558, and the crown passed to her sister, Queen Elizabeth I of England. If you want to learn more about that happening in England, we covered that in more depth on the two-parter about the two movies, Elizabeth and Elizabeth, the Golden Age. That complicated matters because, you see, Mary Stuart was also related to King Henry VIII of England. Her father's grandmother was Margaret Tudor, who was King Henry VIII's sister. That made Mary Stuart the grand-niece of King Henry VIII of England. In 1543, When King Henry VIII died, the Parliament of England passed the Third Succession Act, and that placed Henry's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, in the line of succession. By the way, that's a different Mary, not Mary Stuart. There were so many Marys back then. After Queen Mary I of England, and again, that's not Mary Stuart, died in November of 1558, The question of who would sit on the throne of England was not something that everyone agreed on. A big reason for this was because of their parents. Even though both of Henry VIII's daughters were, well, his daughters, they did not have the same mother. Queen Mary I was the daughter of Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Elizabeth, on the other hand, was the daughter of King Henry VIII and 
and Bolin. And if you listen to the Based on a True Story episode about the other Bolin girl, then you'll know all about how King Henry VIII tried to get the Catholic Church to annul his marriage to Catherine in a series of events that would eventually cause the Church of England to split from the Catholic Church. As such, a lot of the Catholics didn't believe that Elizabeth was a legitimate child and should not be an heir to the throne of England. So, if Elizabeth was not the legitimate heir to the throne, that would mean it would fall to the next oldest relative of King Henry VIII. And you guessed it, that was Mary Stuart. None of this was helped by the fact that King Henry VIII himself had specifically put something in his last will and testament to say that no member of the Stuart household shall take the throne of England. That complicated matters even more, and in the end, you're left with essentially two sides. People trying to figure out this complexity, and there were people who believed that Elizabeth had a legitimate right to the throne of England, and other people who believed that Mary Stuart had a legitimate right to the throne of England. And of course, we might as well throw in even more complexity because it wasn't just the politics that people disagreed with each other on. It was also religion. Elizabeth was Protestant, and Mary was Catholic. Whew. I know that's a ton to sift through. Although, to be fair, I did say it was complicated. Feel free to jump back to the beginning of the episode and listen again to unravel everything if you need to. But for now, let's head back to the movie's timeline because it's right around this point where we see Mary for the first time in the film. Although technically the movie starts off with a brief scene in England in 1587, this is giving us a peek into what's going to happen as we see Mary walk to the room where she's to be executed. But we don't see a lot of details in this scene. In fact, the camera stays behind Mary's head so we never even see her face. So let's leave that for later. Which means, for now... The next scene is set in 1561, just as Mary Stuart, who's played by Cersei Ronan, returns to Scotland from France after the death of her husband, King Francis II. In Scotland, she's greeted by a man who we find out is her half-brother, James. He's played by, well, another James, James McArdle. Then there's a brief scene where we see Mary talking to the court after she arrives in Scotland for the first time. When she does, she says that her subjects will be free to worship however they prefer, Catholics and Protestants alike. While those specific scenes are made up for the movie, of course, it was on August 19, 1561, when Mary made her way back to Scotland. That was about nine months after her husband's death in France. When she arrived in Scotland, she had no idea what she was walking into. After all, she'd been in France for most of her life up to this point. Although Mary was a Catholic, her half-brother, Lord Moray, was Protestant, and she kept him on as her chief advisor after she returned to Scotland. To add to that, some historians have suggested perhaps Mary's choice in advisors, being mostly Protestant instead, might have indicated perhaps she had an eye on the throne of England all along. After all, if she were satisfied with her throne in Scotland and wanted to focus on bettering the Scottish relationship with the French, then shouldn't she have mostly Catholic advisors? But she didn't. She had 16 advisors and only four were Catholic. Back in the movie, over in England, Margot Robbie's version of Queen Elizabeth finds out about her cousin's arrival to the island. While she doesn't know exactly what Mary's intentions are, she's well aware of the threat that Mary poses to her own claim on the throne of England. Afraid that Mary will end up marrying a Catholic who will be anti-English, Elizabeth decides that the man that she loves, Robert Dudley, should go to Scotland to wed Mary. The idea there being that if Mary is wed to the English and Protestant, Robert, then Elizabeth can control Mary because Elizabeth can control Robert. But, according to the movie, this is something Elizabeth quickly regrets because she loves Robert. Mary actually agrees to marry Robert only if she's named successor to the throne of England. But instead, it's Lord Henry Darnley who ends up wooing Mary. She's quite taken by Henry, quite literally at one point in the movie. Robert Dudley is played by Joe Alwyn, while Henry Darnley is played by Jack Loden, by the way. While there's a fair amount of creative license with the specifics of how this is portrayed, of course, that's to be expected, 
After all, it's not like we have recordings to know exactly what was said. However, the plot point that Queen Elizabeth suggested Robert Dudley marry Queen Mary is true. Now, if you listen to the episodes where we cover the two Kate Blanchett Elizabeth movies, you'll know who Robert Dudley was. But in a nutshell, he was the Earl of Leicester in England. There were rumors circling that he killed his own wife so he might marry the woman he really loved, Queen Elizabeth. But in an ironic twist, those rumors themselves helped fuel the politics that basically kept Elizabeth from marrying him. After all, the Queen of England can't be wed to an alleged murderer. So, instead, just like the movie implies, Elizabeth tried to control Mary by getting her to marry Robert. This was in the spring of 1563, and Elizabeth sent the ambassador to Scotland, a man named Thomas Randolph, to tell Mary about her idea. At first, Mary agreed to the idea. But when Thomas tried to convince Robert Dudley about the arranged marriage, he was not interested. After all, as we learned earlier, Elizabeth was the woman he loved not Mary. In an attempt to get Robert to agree to the marriage, that is when Elizabeth gave Robert Dudley the title of Earl of Leicester, making Canelworth Castle his home. But before anything came out of that, just like the movie shows, Mary Stuart met Lord Henry Darnley. According to records, the two met on a Saturday, the 17th of February in the year 1565, so a couple years after Robert was given the title, Earl of Leicester. Mary and Henry hit it off right away, and before long, the two planned to marry. This did not make Elizabeth happy. Not only because it would mean that she'd have less control over Mary, but also because Henry himself had a claim to the throne of England. It wasn't as strong as Mary's, of course, but just like Mary Stuart, Henry Darnley was a grandchild of King Henry VIII's sister, Margaret Tudor. So, that meant Mary and Henry were first cousins. It also meant that if they were married, that combined two claims to the throne of England. In other words, it would only strengthen Mary's already strong claim to the throne in England. Going back to the movie, there's a civil war going on between two factions of Scots. On one side is Mary's followers, while on the other side is her half-brother, Lord Moray. He was upset because Mary decided to marry Lord Darnley, despite Elizabeth's demand that Darnley return to England. So, in an attempt to stir up even more dissent among the Scots, England supports a rebellion against Mary led by Lord Moray. As the fighting ensues, Mary's forces get the better of Moray's troops, Mary is watching from afar and calls off the fight just before her half-brother is killed. That rebellion really happened. It took place after Queen Mary and Lord Darnley were married. As we learned earlier, Mary's half-brother was James Stewart, the Earl of Moray. And if you recall, he's played by James McArdle in the movie. Even though he was Mary's half-brother, the Earl of Moray was also Protestant. He did not like the idea of his Catholic half-sister marrying a Catholic and solidifying, well, two Catholics taking control in Scotland. So, after Mary and Henry were married in July of 1565, James led a rebellion against his half-sister. There's nothing that I could find in my research to indicate that James came within a few feet of being killed like we see in the movie. But all we know from history is that Mary's forces far outnumbered her half-brothers. Now let's take a step back for a moment here to consider just how this must have impacted Mary. James was her half-brother. He was her chief advisor when she returned to Scotland from France a few years earlier. In fact, just three years before Mary and Henry were married, James himself led Mary's soldiers into battle to squash a rebellion by the fourth Earl of Huntley. But he was so opposed to Mary and Henry's wedding that he turned on his half-sister. They were married at Holyrood Palace on July 29th, 1565, and less than a month later, on August 26th, Mary led an army bolstered by troops from James Hepburn, the fourth Earl of Bothwell, who had returned from exile in France, and he helped give Mary enough troops to put down the rebellion of her half-brother. 
In the movie, by the way, James Hepburn is cast simply as Lord Bothwell, and he's played by Martin Compston. After being defeated, James Stewart was forced to flee Scotland and went to England seeking protection from Queen Elizabeth. Let's head back to the movie's timeline now, where the next pivotal plot point happens right after Mary and Darnley are wed. Speaking of which, after they were married, that would make him Henry Stewart, so that's yet another name for the man known as Lord Darnley. Before the rebellion, Mary had walked in on Henry sleeping with someone else named David Rizzio. He's played by Ismail. He's played by Ismail Cruz Cordova. He begs for forgiveness, which Mary provides. She was obviously upset by this, but at the same time, she was dealing with the rebellion. After that's quelled, Mary tries to conceive with Henry. It's a success, and she's pregnant with someone that she claims to be the heir to the throne of both Scotland and England. That doesn't make the English too happy. Then, things get even worse in one of the most disturbing scenes in the movie. This happens when Mary, David Rizzio, and a couple of her maids are playing cards around the table in Mary's chamber. All of a sudden, a bunch of men barge in. The movie makes it hard to tell exactly how many there are at one time, but I counted well over a dozen in one frame. However, it is clear that one of them is Mary's husband, because when Mary tries to stop them, one of the men assures her that everything that's being done is done in Henry's name. Mary tries to guard David by placing herself in front of him. But one of the men stabs him from the back. Mary is forced to stand aside, leaving the men free to stab David over and over. That murder happened. After Mary's half-brother fled to England, he started plotting a coup against his sister and her new husband. Part of that involved getting rid of the man by his sister's side who was now acting as her closest political advisor. And I'm not talking about Mary's husband. Of course, being further away from Mary's side, it's not likely that James knew Mary's new marriage was, well, not going so well. Henry and Mary were married in July of 1565, but Mary was so disillusioned by Henry's drinking and sleeping around with others that she effectively distanced herself from him by the end of that same year. According to the movie, one of those we see Henry sleeping with is David Rizzio, While I couldn't find anything in my research to suggest that that actually happened, many historians believe that Henry suspected David was sleeping with Mary. A big part of that was because, well, Mary distanced herself from Henry, but also because David was Mary's private secretary. Even though that's a position he rose to in 1564, before Mary and Henry were wed, when Mary distanced herself from Henry, and then Mary's half-brother went to England, and so she didn't have her chief advisor there anymore. It would make sense that David basically stepped up into that role of an advisor. And so Henry started to become jealous of the man who really had a closer relationship with his wife than he did. It probably didn't help that there were tons of rumors floating around that David was having an affair with Mary. Oh, and by this time, Mary was pregnant with a child, and some of those rumors suggested that the child was not Henry's, but David's. Of course, some historians suggest that many of those rumors were actually spread by Henry in an attempt to justify killing David. Regardless of who spread those rumors, though, just like the movie depicts, Henry joined a plot to kill David. Although he was still in England at this point, the Earl of Moray was also involved in this plot. The movie's depiction of David's murder was horrifying, but sadly, probably pretty accurate. David was having dinner with Mary and a few of her maids when Henry walked into the room. As the story goes, he sat down next to Mary and put an arm around her waist. That wasn't normal. Then, more men burst into the room, wearing full suits of armor. Mary jumped to her feet. What is the meaning of this? We can only imagine what she must have said. David ducked behind Mary, clinging to her garments. The attendants there with Mary tried to resist, but the men pulled out pistols and waved them back. More men filed into the room. 
Then Henry's uncle, a man named George Douglas, pulled a dagger from Henry's belt and stabbed David. While it's tough to verify events from such a chaotic scene as this, some believe Mary recalled the events herself later on and said that the first attack on David was done over her shoulder. Mary was soon forced aside and David was stabbed to death. Most historians believe he was stabbed 56 times. But we don't know the exact number for sure because after he was stabbed to death, his body was disposed of quickly by his killers. What we do know is that after he was murdered, Henry ordered David's body to be thrown down the staircase, a stone staircase, where it was then stripped of his fine clothing and jewelry. Within two hours of his murder, David's body had been buried at Holyrood. We don't really know where he was buried. It's been said that his body was moved elsewhere by the order of Queen Mary. However, today there's a plaque that marks what we believe to be David Rizzio's grave. I'll include a link to where you can see a photo of the grave over on the page for this episode at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Going back to the movie now, after David is murdered, Mary decides it's best for her, Henry, and their unborn child to leave. So they do. We don't ever see where they're going, just the caravan leaving one castle and arriving at another. Meanwhile, there's a lot of other plots going on. On one hand, those involved in David's murder are seeking a pardon from Mary. She agrees to pardon them if they'll provide her with the bond that proves her husband was involved in the killing. They agree to this deal and show up with the paper that Henry and the other conspirators signed condemning David to death. Before he's confronted by this, though, we see Mary giving birth to a baby boy. After this, she confronts Henry with the bond that he signed to kill David and ends up banishing him. But that's not enough for some of her advisors who plot to have Henry killed. Of course, as I mentioned before, there's going to be some creative liberties with the dialogue and specifics, but it is true that Mary sought to get to the bottom of the plot that saw David murdered. Some historians even suggest as soon as Mary was told that David was dead, she dried her eyes and stated that she would cry no more tears. Now, I will think upon revenge. As part of that revenge, Mary teamed up with someone we mentioned briefly earlier. That would be James Hepburn, the fourth Earl of Bothwell, or as the movie calls him, Lord Bothwell. But that's getting a little ahead of our story. For now, at this point, as the movie shows, she was still pregnant, so revenge had to wait. In April of 1566, Mary moved to Edinburgh Castle while she was in the later months of her pregnancy. On June 19, 1566, a baby boy was born, James. Oh, and I mentioned earlier, briefly, that there was a line in the movie where we see Mary declare James as being the heir to the throne of Scotland and England. While I couldn't find anywhere to suggest that she said that herself, it is true that a French poet drew the fury of the queen, Queen Elizabeth that is, when they described that the young Prince James was the Prince of Scotland, England, France, and Ireland. The plot point where we see Mary confronting Henry's involvement in the plan to murder David is also pretty accurate. By that, what I mean is that it is true that Mary used Henry's involvement in the plot to get him to turn on some of the others. Some of them fled to England, but Mary pardoned her half-brother, the Earl of Moray, and some of the others involved in the plot. That included Henry. But that didn't make their marriage any better. Living apart from Henry as she gave birth to Prince James, Mary continued to live separately from her husband after James's birth. Back in the movie, we see Henry going back to what he does, drinking and sleeping around, when an explosion rocks the house he's in one night. In her bed, we see Mary wake up to the sound of dogs barking, presumably from the explosion. As Henry escapes from the burning home, cloaked figures run to his aid. Except, they're not there to help Henry. They wrap a rope around his neck, choking the life out of him. That basic idea is true. But there's so much more to the story that we don't see in the movie. 
It's also not likely that he was strangled like we see in the movie either. What the movie doesn't show is that soon after James's birth, Mary got word that Henry had fallen horribly ill. That's why Mary would have been closer to Henry because even though they lived apart from each other, she visited him on a daily basis as he fought the illness. Most historians believe that illness was probably syphilis, although officially it was recorded as smallpox. But then, in the early morning hours of February 10th, 1567, an explosion destroyed the home that Henry was in. According to the great book called Lord Darnley, Oxford Dictionary of National Biography by Elaine Finney Gregg, after the explosion, Henry's body was found alongside a servant's body under a tree in the garden. There was a chair, a dagger, a coat, and a cloak. Although there had been an explosion, neither of their bodies had been harmed by the blast. They also hadn't been shot. They hadn't been beaten. They had not been strangled like we see in the movie. Most historians believe they had been suffocated to death. But the true story, well, that's one of those historical mysteries that we'll never know exactly what happened to Lord Darnley. That doesn't mean there weren't rumors, though. And most of these centered around Mary herself being involved in the killing. Another person said to have been involved was the fourth Earl of Bothwell, James Hepburn. He was the man Mary turned to to help squash the rebellion of her half-brother years earlier. For her part, Mary also didn't seem too down on her husband's unexplained death, Some historians point to letters from Henry's father to Mary asking her to investigate his son's death. She refused, instead telling him that Parliament would investigate it when they were scheduled to meet again in the spring. When the investigation did happen, though, the finger pointed to Bothwell pretty quickly. Some people deposed in the investigation after the explosion explained that Bothwell had been the one who put the gunpowder in Lord Darnley's home. On April 12, 1567, Bothwell stood trial for the death of Lord Darnley. But no witnesses showed up. All of a sudden, no one could speak against him. Of course, it probably helped that some 4,000 of Bothwell's soldiers were in the streets just outside the courthouse, So, was it that no one could speak against him, or that no one wanted to speak against him? The trial lasted for seven hours that day. In the end, Lord Bothwell was declared not guilty. But Lord Bothwell was just getting started. Eight days later, on April 20th, he hosted a dinner with a number of Scottish leaders. At the dinner, he convinced eight bishops, nine earls, and seven lords to sign a document that today is called the Ainsley Tavern Bond, because it was signed at the Ainsley Tavern in Edinburgh. One of those earls was the Earl of Moray, Mary's half-brother, James Stewart. That bond not only backed up Lord Bothwell's recent acquittal of any involvement in Lord Darnley's death, but it also officially gave Lord Bothwell their backing as a replacement husband to Mary Stewart. Historians have debated back and forth exactly how much Mary consented to what happened next, but what we know is that four days later, on April 24th, Lord Bothwell stopped Mary as she was traveling on the road coming back from Stirling, where her son James was being raised. Bothwell took her to Dunbar Castle, where it's documented that he, quote, ravished her, end quote. What we don't know is if she consented to that or if it was rape. For that matter, we also don't know if Mary went to Dunbar Castle willingly or if she was kidnapped. What we do know is that while Mary had just lost her husband a few months before, Lord Bothwell, well, he was still married. His wife was named Lady Jean Gordon, and they had been married for just over a year at this point. They were married on February 24th, 1566. But it's clear Lord Bothwell had his sights set on marrying Queen Mary. So, he had his marriage to Lady Jean annulled on May 7, 1567. And, eight days later, on May 15, Lord Bothwell and Mary Stuart were married at Hollywood Palace. 
Although some sources say that Lord Bothwell's divorce was more like 12 days before he married Mary, but you still get the idea. Back in the movie, we see Mary reach out to her cousin on the throne of England. To the dismay of Queen Elizabeth's advisors, the two cousins agree that if Elizabeth had a child, it would be the heir to the throne of England. If she doesn't, Mary's child will be the heir. But Mary has another rebellion to deal with. After Henry is killed, Mary's own advisors tell her that the Scottish people don't trust her, so they convince her to marry a Scottish man next. But this only adds fuel to the fire for David Tennant's character, the preacher John Knox. He continues to spread the word that Mary is a harlot, moving from one man to another in quick succession. Although I couldn't find anything in my research to indicate Mary convincing Elizabeth to let her son take over the throne of England if Elizabeth didn't have any children of her own, the line of succession would suggest that that would be the case anyway. After all, we already learned that Mary had a claim to the throne of England as well. If Elizabeth's claim ended with her, the natural heir would be Mary's son. The movie also seems to skip over all of the Lord Bothwell complexity that we already learned about. He's who the movie is referring to when they're recommending to Mary that she marry a Scottish man. Well, she may have been counseled in this way. If she were, that was really bad counsel. Now, yes, John Knox was a real person. And yes, he did preach against the Catholic Mary Stuart. But the movie seems to imply he was the primary person behind the coup to oust Mary from the throne. However, most historians agree that Mary's marriage to Lord Bothwell played a huge part in her downfall, too. After Mary was married to Bothwell, the Scottish people were torn. On one hand, Mary was their queen. On the other, her husband had just died in a very suspicious death. The chief suspect in the killing had turned out to be Lord Bothwell, and now Mary is marrying him? Sure, he had been officially declared not guilty, but even back then, there were a lot of people who didn't buy that. I mean, the guy basically laid siege to the courthouse with his men to try to scare witnesses away who might speak against him. All of this turmoil split the Scots into two sides, those still supporting Mary and those who demanded that she give up the throne. All of those Scottish nobles who Mary thought were supporting her marriage to Lord Bothwell now had soured on the idea. Or maybe it was that they were forced into a fake support of the marriage. I guess we'll never know that part for sure. What we do know is that many of the Scottish lords turned on Mary. She dealt with rebellions before, but this one was different. This one she lost. The battle took place at Carberry Hill on June 15th, 1567, exactly one month after Mary and Bothwell were married. Although, I guess calling it a battle isn't quite right. There really wasn't even a fight. As Mary tried to negotiate with the lords, most of Mary's soldiers deserted her. Lord Bothwell escaped the battlefield, but Mary was arrested and taken captive at Loch Leven Castle. Oh, and although the movie never shows this, Lord Bothwell escaped capture that day at Carberry Hill. He was forced into exile. He would end up dying in Denmark in the year 1578 after being imprisoned and driven to insanity. As the movie comes to an end, Mary meets in secret with her cousin, Queen Elizabeth. She tells Elizabeth about what's going on in her country, and Elizabeth explains that she can't help Mary get her throne back because she's a Catholic. She can't go to war for a Catholic. Taking off her hairpiece, Elizabeth tells Mary how... She had it made because she was jealous of Mary's beauty, of her bravery, and of her motherhood. But now she realizes that she has nothing to envy because those things only contributed to Mary's downfall. Still, Elizabeth promises her that she'll be safe in England for as long as she doesn't provoke Elizabeth's enemies. Mary, in turn, tells Elizabeth that if she does, it'll mean Elizabeth pushed her into their arms. And if you murder me... You remember, you murdered your sister. After this meeting is when we're taken to the scene that we saw in the very beginning of the movie, where Mary is imprisoned. Elizabeth's voiceover explains that 
She's been confronted with evidence that Mary conspired with Catholics to take the throne of England. They're supposedly in Mary's own handwriting, but none of that can be proven. It doesn't matter, though. We saw how this turns out in the beginning of the movie. Queen Elizabeth signs the paper that condemns her cousin, Queen Mary, to death. She cries for her cousin, but she's not present in the room when the deed is done. Instead, Mary arrives in a black dress to a room full of men. According to the man sentencing Mary, quote, by order of our sovereign Elizabeth, end quote, the date is February the 8th in the year 1587. Before kneeling, Mary's maids strip off her black dress to reveal a bright red one underneath. The crown murmurs as she kneels on the wooden platform. She speaks of her son, her only son, James, and offers a prayer that he will be able to unite two kingdoms in a way that she could not. Then, with a hand from the executioner on her back, her head is placed on the chopping block. The axe is in frame, and the screen goes black. After the movie is over, there's a few lines of final text that lets us know how Mary's life continued to influence the world even after her death. According to these lines, even though Mary's plot to kill Elizabeth could never be proven, after Mary's death, the Scottish claim to the throne was put to rest. However, Elizabeth never married. She never had children. So, after her reign of 45 years came to an end with her own death, Mary's son, James, became the first person to ever rule as monarch of both England and Scotland together. While the basic gist of all of that is true, the movie skips over quite a few important plot points in an attempt to simplify the story. As we learned earlier, Mary was captured at Carberry Hill after trying to confront some rebelling Scottish lords. That was on June 15, 1567. About a month later, on July 24, 1567, Mary was forced to sign letters announcing her willingness to abdicate the throne of Scotland. According to the letters, she said that the two reasons for her abdicating the throne were, quote, vexation and weariness, end quote. In her place, her son would take the throne. James's coronation was five days later on July 29th. But at this point, James was only one year old, so he couldn't rule. That's why on August 22nd, James Stuart, the Earl of Moray, and Mary's half-brother was appointed as the regent of Scotland, until James was of age to take the throne himself. On December 12, 1567, the Scottish Parliament passed the Act Annets the Demission of the Crown in Favor of Our Sovereign Lord and His Majesty's Coronation. Basically, that official title was a document that accepted the abdication of Mary Stuart, confirming her son as King James VI of Scotland, as well as the Earl of Moray's Regency. As for Mary, she managed to escape her imprisonment at Loch Leven Castle, although some historians have pointed out that with her half-brother now running Scotland, it's possible that her escape wasn't something that she orchestrated as much as it was him letting her go. Regardless, though, one of the men who helped Mary escape her imprisonment was none other than George Douglas. If that name rings a bell, it's because he was the one who some believe was the first to stab David Rizzio. As we learned earlier, he was also Lord Darnley's uncle, but he was also the brother of Sir William Douglas, who happened to be the guy who owned Loch Leven Castle, where Mary was in prison. However she managed to get out, Mary left Loch Leven on May 2nd, 1568, after being there for almost a year. But she did not leave Scotland. She raised an army of her supporters and tried to have a rebellion of her own. This time, though, it was Mary who was rebelling against her half-brother, the Earl of Moray. Although some have estimated Mary's soldiers to be a sizable force of about 6,000 men, they weren't enough. Called the Battle of Langside, Mary's forces were defeated on May 13, 1568. This time, she did not stay in Scotland. Instead, she fled south, and a few days later, on May 16th, she made her way to England. Two days later, on May 18th, she was taken into custody by the local authorities and taken to nearby Carlisle Castle. 
While the movie never shows this, James Stewart, the Earl of Moray, was assassinated less than two years later on January 23rd, 1570, by a supporter of Mary's. As for Mary, some people believe she thought Elizabeth would help her get the throne back in Scotland. But Elizabeth was more cautious. She didn't know if Mary was involved in Lord Darnley's murder. So she had Mary moved from Carlisle Castle to Bolton Castle. That's further south and farther away from the Scots who might try to either rescue her or kill her. Who knows what they might try. Basically, Elizabeth was buying time while she was trying to figure out what to do with her cousin. During all of this, an investigation into Mary's involvement in Lord Darnley's death continued. One of the key pieces of evidence was something called the casket letters. They were letters written by Mary to Lord Bothwell, or at least that was the claim. Mary's half-brother, the Earl of Moray, presented them to Parliament in a silver casket bearing Francis II's monogram on it, hence the name, casket letters. If you recall, Francis was Mary's first husband many years earlier. These letters were used as evidence against Mary and as proof that she was involved in Lord Darnley's murder. For her part, Mary refused to attend court to defend herself. She was a queen, and she didn't believe that queens should bow to the power of the courts in such ways. But she did send representatives, and through them, she denied the authenticity of the casket letters. She said someone forged her handwriting. And to be honest, the casket letters are something that a lot of historians have debated over the centuries, and continue to debate today. Some believe that they might have been written by Mary, but someone inserted the more damning of the passages into them, and making it seem like Mary had actually written all of them. Still others believe that they were entirely authentic, and yet others believe that they were forged entirely as a way to frame Mary. It's a mystery that we won't know the answer to anytime soon, if at all. For the next 18 and a half years, Mary was bounced around from one castle to another in England. She was never released, although not like she was kept in a cold, dark cell under the castle. Most historians believe she was allowed to decorate her quarters and move about somewhat freely on castle grounds. We also know that she passed time with things that you wouldn't expect a normal prisoner to be able to do, like embroidery. During that time, Elizabeth did try to help her cousin get the Scottish throne back. Of course, it would be under the condition of guarantees for Protestants, so that was rejected. In the end, the movie's depiction of Mary's final demise is also true. We talked a lot about the different plots against Queen Elizabeth in the Elizabeth movie episodes, but... There were basically three key plots. One was called the Rodolfi plot after its mastermind, Roberto Rodolfi. His plan was, basically, to kill Queen Elizabeth and establish Mary as the new Queen of England. That plot was foiled in 1571 by Elizabeth's right-hand spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham. Then there was the Throckmorton plot, named after its mastermind, Sir Francis Throckmorton. Although the names involved were different, the basic idea was the same kill Queen Elizabeth, and replace her with Mary. That plot was also thwarted by Walsingham in 1583. The final plot was known as the Babington Plot, named after Anthony Babington. After the previous two plots, Walsingham tried to prove that Mary had approved of these attempts on Elizabeth's life. So he had Mary's letters smuggled out of where she was being held and decrypted without her knowledge. When he did this, he found the evidence that he needed to prove that Mary was indeed behind the plot to overthrow Elizabeth. On August 11th, 1586, Mary was out riding her horse when she was approached by armed soldiers. She was arrested and charged with a conspiracy in the plots against Queen Elizabeth. She was sent to Fotheringay Castle where she awaited trial. That took place in October and, on the 25th of that month, she was found guilty and sentenced to death. But it didn't happen right away. Even despite overwhelming evidence against her cousin, Queen Elizabeth did not condemn Mary to death immediately. For one, the evidence may have been damning, but nothing was entirely certain. Mary had continued to deny all the charges against her. On top of that, Elizabeth wasn't really sure that she liked the idea of executing a queen. If she did that, 
Would Mary's son, James, turn on Elizabeth and try to do the same to her? That might not be a good precedent to set. At first, she tried to convince the man watching over Mary to, well, take care of it for her. He refused. So, on February 1st, 1587, Queen Elizabeth signed the order to execute Mary Stuart. It was to be carried out immediately. Of course, immediately doesn't mean that day. It was on the morning of February 8th, 1587, that Mary's sentence was carried out. Just like we see in the movie, it happened inside. It was the Great Hall at Fotheringay Castle where they built a small platform, just a step or two high. In the movie, we see Mary's attendants strip off her black dress to reveal a bright red one underneath. While that's sort of true, I don't know that it would have been as bright as what we see in the movie. Accounts of that day mention that when Mary's black dress was removed, underneath she wore velvet with crimson brown sleeves. The symbolism was there, though. That was the color to represent martyrdom in the Catholic Church. There were other differences, too between the movie and what really happened. For example, in the movie, we don't see the blindfold of white with gold embroidering that was placed over her eyes. But we do see Mary speaking Latin in the movie. Mary's final words were, In manis tuos domine commendo spiritum meum. And since my Latin is horrible, the English translation of that is, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. We don't see the actual act in the movie either. It was not a quick death that you might expect. The first blow of the axe hit the back of her head. It took another to do most of the damage to her neck, with another to finally remove her head. Probably the biggest difference, though, has to do with something that the movie doesn't even show. In the movie, and we mentioned this earlier, there's a scene just before Mary is taken into custody where she's talking with Elizabeth. In that scene, we see Elizabeth take off her wig to reveal much shorter hair underneath. Margot Robbie's version of Elizabeth tears up as she explains that she had the wig made in an attempt to look pretty like Mary. It's also clear that Sir Sir Ronan's version of Mary is not wearing a wig. But that is not true. After Mary was beheaded, the executioner held up her head and declared, God save the queen. When he did this, Mary's auburn wig fell off, revealing short, gray hair underneath. She was 44 years old. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. There's so much more political complexity and intrigue to this story. After all, there's a reason why Mary and Elizabeth have been debated and discussed by historians for hundreds of years and probably will continue to be for hundreds more. If you want to learn more about Mary's life, I'd recommend starting with a biography that the movie is based on. It's by John Guy and it's called Queen of Scots, The True Life of Mary Stewart. Oh, and if you haven't yet, go check out the other three episodes of Based on a True Story that I mentioned in this one. That would be when we covered The Other Boleyn Girl, which is all about Queen Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, and her husband, King Henry VIII. And then there were the two Kate Blanchett movies about Queen Elizabeth called Elizabeth and Elizabeth, the Golden Age. Between those three, you'll get a ton more information about this whole era in history. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Mary's first husband was the King of France. Number two, Mary married her cousin. Number three, Mary was executed for her part in killing her husband. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. That is true. As we learned, Mary was married to Francis when he ascended to the French throne in 1559. But that didn't last long as King Francis II died in 1560. That brings us to number two. That is also true. Of course, Mary had multiple husbands throughout her lifetime, but... The one that was her cousin was Lord Darnley, also known as Henry Stuart, after they were married. He was the father of James, who would become king of both England and Scotland. 
although some have speculated that perhaps James's real father was actually David Rizzio, but there's no proof of that. Finally, that must mean that the lie is number three. Even though Mary's alleged part in her husband Lord Darnley's death and subsequent marriage to the chief suspect had a hand to play in her downfall, Mary's execution didn't really have to do with any of that. It was because of her alleged plot to kill Queen Elizabeth and take her place on the throne of England. That brings us to an end of this episode. I know this episode took a lot longer to release than usual, and if you're wondering why, well, I explained all that in the last episode called Change. But in a nutshell, new episodes will be released on a less consistent schedule as they have been in the past. In the meantime, if you'd like to add to the story, hop on to the Based on a True Story Facebook group, or you can reach out to me directly on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. And if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Until we chat again, thanks so much for listening, and bye for now.